This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. According to the World Health Organization, approximately 73 million children are aborted worldwide each year, making abortion the number one cause of death in the world today. The WHO, however, doesn't list abortion as the leading cause of death. Abortion is killing a child, and that child is an innocent being, whether we acknowledge it or not. I clearly believe that that's murder in there. The WHO claims that abortion is a, quote, essential health care service. To kill a child in a womb is not care. It is not giving them health. You have options. You have alternatives. There are people here on this sidewalk that are compassionate for you. We love you. That lack of access to, quote, safe abortion poses risks to women's physical and mental health. I did not realize the depth of the emotional pain that I would experience. The risk of abortion, not just the physical risk to a woman, but the emotional risk. It's been shown that women who've had abortions have higher rates of depression and substance abuse. And that abortion regulation risks violating the human rights of women and girls, including the right to privacy. What about the right, the privacy of the child within the womb and their rights? Even if we do say there's a right to privacy, that doesn't trump an unborn human being's right to life. I mean, if we don't honor the very basic right to life, the rest of the rights don't matter. The Biden administration is the most pro-death administration. But even as the Biden administration aggressively seeks to roll back policies protecting the unborn and expand global abortion practices, there is hope. Tennessee Right to Life has a two-pronged mission. It's education and legislation. Our mission is to enlighten the public the pro-life cause enlightens women by giving them the full picture of what happens when you have an abortion. The abortion industry does not seek to empower and enlighten women. They seek to deceive and devour women. We need to educate um, not only those who are firmly pro-life, but we also need to combat the messaging. Grassroots efforts is, has really been our most successful way. When the most pro-abortion administration ever has been put in place, 90 abortion restrictions were passed across the nation. My generation will be the generation that breaks the curse. That means that we need to fight, and we need to fight for the truth. I was probably at the worst place of my life uh, in 1992 when my father passed away. I met my soon-to-be husband, and I was drawn to him because he had so many characteristics that my father had. We talked about not having any children because he had a child from his previous marriage. At the time that I was going to visit my father who was dying, he was dying from AIDS. So it was a slow, painful death but I was in a state of depression. I went to my gynecologist, and that's when I learned I was pregnant. My doctor gave me a, a pamphlet for a clinic in Knoxville, Tennessee. I went to the clinic and encountered some pro-life protesters outside the clinic. That kind of like made me want to think twice about it. I've got a text this past week, a lady said, uh... You rescued my child from abortion. You were at the gates when I pulled in. I'm thankful that you're at the gates because uh, my child is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. But I went back three days later and I had the abortion, even though there was this voice saying, get up, get up. I didn't get up off that table and uh, immediately regretted my decision and prayed to God all the way home and asked for forgiveness. I did not realize the depth of the emotional pain that I would experience as a result of that. For about nine years, I was just sinking deeper and deeper into depression over the abortion. And 
and even though four years later I had another pregnancy and brought my child to life, every milestone in my child's life that reminded me of the one that I didn't have. And so one day as I was traveling home, after having picked up my child from daycare and passing the very spot where the abortion had taken place, I just became even more and more determined that I didn't want to live anymore with that guilt and that shame. So I was driving and I saw this truck coming at me from the opposite direction. So I started to speed up and move my car into the front of that truck. And I heard my child say, Mommy, I had a dream about my brother. I had never mentioned abortion to my daughter. That was on a Thursday, um, Friday, at the very same spot in the road. She said, I had another dream about my brother. And so I was pretty much undone by that time. Um, but I knew that this was the voice of God telling me, trying to get my attention and reminding me that abortion, it's taking the life of innocence. And then that Monday at the same place in the road, with my daughter at the same place in the road, three days. She said, I had another dream about my brother. I said, tell me about your brother. And she began to describe what he looked like and the color of his hair and his eyes. And, and I asked, well, what's his name? And she said, his name is Adam. And I said, well, how old is he? And she said, he is eight years old. And I was just rejoicing. And she, I said, well, what's he doing? And she just, in her, her way, she said, oh, mom. He's playing, <laughs> he's doing what all kids do, he's playing. And so that was me being saved, I think, by God. I don't think I had a value for life until that very moment when I knew that he had saved me. The beautiful thing about Tennessee Right to Life is we work with other organizations. While our mission is education and legislation, we work with pregnancy resource centers to help the women who are in a vulnerable position for abortion. You have a lot of single mothers who are left terrified. What's, what's going to happen to my life, my career, what if my family finds out? And these are legitimate questions and they deserve compassion from both sides, especially from Christians. But when you have the abortion industry targeting it, it it's it's targeting people when they're emotionally vulnerable, when they're scared. We share some information with you, praying for you. That's a father and a daughter. Who brought his daughter here to the board? She couldn't have been 14 years old. No, she is, you could tell too, she's like, she has no clue what's going on. Sad. Well, our, our generation has been targeted by Planned Parenthood through uh, social media. It makes sense when you look at um, what the abortion industry's agenda is, what they're, they're looking to promote. If you tell somebody something enough times, they believe it um, subconsciously. What's being drilled into the heads of the young people through our culture, it doesn't even have to be from an official Planned Parenthood source. It could just be from a talking head. It's a woman's right to choose and you can't tell her otherwise. And abortion is safe and legal and we can have it on demand whenever we want. If you hear that message enough, they start to believe it. To say that a fetus is not really a human, you have to make a lot of assumptions to get there. Because at some point, you have to decide life starts here. In 1973, you didn't have 3D ultrasounds. You didn't have 4D ultrasounds. We can now see into the womb. You know, we have more protections for the egg of a turtle or a bald eagle, and you go to prison or be fined thousands of dollars for that, but we have no protection for that life within the womb of a mother. Sadly, they are admitting that it's killing a child, and now they're, um, what they're saying is, it's better to kill that child than to have an unwanted child. If that were puppies that were being killed, our society would be outraged. Abortion uh, scars women. You can be made sterile. Um, you can have a utero perforation, um, which can cause internal bleeding. It can even lead to death. 
When, when I went to my first appointment at the abortion provider, I don't remember any counseling about whether you would experience trauma or regret or any of those things. So, or be suicidal, as, because I was for nine years. I can tell you, I stand outside of a Planned Parenthood every day and I see the women coming out and I see the tears in their eyes and the shame that's upon them. And it's not upon them just on that day, but for years and decades. I've encountered women that have aborted over 50 years ago. Last week, 34 years. Three weeks before that, it was 17 years. Those women are still crying. The abortion industry is motivated by one singular fact. It's not health care. It's not concern for women. It's not societal issues. It's money. That is what motivates the abortion industry. All the ones that I have spoken with have indeed regretted having had an abortion. And they talked about how they think about their children. You know, they think about their children on the day that they would have given birth or the day that they had the abortion or when they found out that they were pregnant. All of those things that I experienced. I think that if we're going to advance as a society, that advance should be defined at the very least along the lines of an advance in morality, in compassion, in love. However, if we consider advance meaning society to be killing children, then that's, that's no advance at all. It's a retreat into the dark ages. It's a retreat from moral goodness and, and into darkness and depravity. It's a, a complete misunderstanding of what progress really is. 2,500 a day in our country, 30,000 a day in China. Uh, I don't think that's progress. You know, over 20 million black children have been murdered since that time. So there's 20 million African Americans that should be alive in America today, having a chance at life, but they don't because their life was snuffed out in the womb. We have choices every day. We choose to do what's right or we choose to do what's wrong. Murder is not right. It's never right. Telling people what to do. You're not stopping anything, buddy. You're not stopping anything. It's still going on, right? It's still going on. Was what, killing you stopped you. 300 people or something? That's hey, nothing. If somebody was killing you, would you want me to stop that? If, somebody... if you even take um, the Christian perspective out of it, follow the science. I mean, you cannot deny that that is a human life. Even if someone is secular, I think they would still be able to see that life is precious even from conception. When a lady is carrying a child, she doesn't say, I have... 20 fingers and 20 toes. She still has 10 toes, 10 fingers, and there's a child within her that probably has 10 toes, 10 fingers. And so there's a separate DNA, a different one-of-a-kind DNA that will never be duplicated again. What I would say to a woman who says, you have no right to tell me what to do is nowhere else in society, nowhere else in our laws do we allow just out and out murder. For every one child waiting to be adopted in the United States, there are 35 couples. There is no shortage of people who are wanting to adopt. And I can tell you adoption is a beautiful thing. And it's a thing that really is illustrates in a microcosm God's love for us. Adoption is the option, right? I know an attorney who does more adoptions than any other attorney and he said he has never had a child he could not place. There are so many families who want these children. There's so many resources available that the abortion lobby fails to bring to the attention of women. We are blessed, especially here in Tennessee. We have an abundance of pregnancy resource centers ready, willing, and able to help a woman who has an unplanned pregnancy. Uh, as someone who was adopted, I would say to my birth mother, thank you for choosing life. As a scared young girl, she still made a wise choice and she brought me into the world and she allowed me to be adopted. And now here I am and I'm here and I'm, I'm fighting for the unborn for those who don't have a voice. There's people who would say, I would never have an abortion myself, but it's not my right to tell other people what to do. What if that were murder? What if that were rape? Would we say the same thing, that we don't have the right to tell somebody they can't do that? Of course we wouldn't. 
that handicapped child has value and uh, as well as any other child. We all have our own handicaps in a, in a roundabout way, some just more severe than others, uh, but some of my best friends in life have been handicapped people. They're made in the image of God, they're perfect in God's eyes, so they deserve a chance as well. For people who, who want to carve out the rape and incest exceptions to abortion law, the pro-abortion side, they want to use that all the time to spout their propaganda, but abortions for those reasons are minimal. Regardless of how a child is conceived, it's still a human being. I've had five women that were raped that I talked out of abortions, but through the nine month period of carrying their child, they fell in love with their child and all of them kept their child. They're not constantly reminded of the rapist. They see the beauty of that child. Tennessee is very pro-life. We're thankful for that. We've passed some of the, the best legislation to make sure we protect all life. Tennessee Right to Life has been involved in legislation for decades. Uh, we took a really big turn uh, in 2014 when Amendment 1 was passed. We amended our state constitution to state that there is no inherent right to abortion. And after that, we were able to put back into place some of the common sense laws and protective measures that had been in place and also some, some new ones like waiting periods when uh, a woman is given 48 hours between the time that she sees an abortionist for the first time and the time that her abortionist performs so that she can have time to think. Because we know that most times if a woman is given time and information, she will choose life. Unfortunately, we live in a society where it's become a form of birth control. And so for me in Tennessee, I just want to make sure that people know in this state, we place a high value on your life and we place a high value on the life of the unborn. And how do we do that? Setting up policies that a young lady who's considering to go get an abortion, that she has all of the facts before her. We also have passed a law of informed consent for the same reason. So when a woman goes for an abortion, she has to be informed of all of her options for her baby and she has to be actually given all the opportunities to consent to having an abortion. Well, the Biden administration and its FDA are, are now openly encouraging the abortion pill to be prescribed and delivered by telemed and mail order prescriptions. We already have it in our law that it's uh, forbidden for doctors to, to prescribe the abortion pill outside of the presence of the woman, but now we're gonna add criminal penalties because if a doctor is prescribing this pill over Zoom or Skype or FaceTime, how do they even know if a woman is pregnant or not? Or how do they know what possible side effects or complications this specific patient might have to the abortion pill? Planned Parenthood has tried very hard to infiltrate our educational system and teach not only about abortion, but many other issues. There's a huge conflict of interest when somebody is teaching sexual education and yet they profit off of bad sexual education. The bill that we're sponsoring this uh, legislative session says that any abortion provider cannot be part of the educational institution. We also don't want people who are killing children in one room teaching our children in another room. We have many outreach programs. We have an educational display table, and it has fetal models that show the baby from conception to birth. It's very eye-opening, and we've had many meaningful conversations with our display. We have uh, annually an art and oratory contest where we invite high school students to participate by presenting a piece of artwork or by presenting a speech. Last year, the Tennessee winner went on to win the national oratory contest. We have our March for Life, which co coincides with Roe v. Wade, January 22nd every year. And it's just a way to gather people, commemorate very solemnly, very prayerfully, the passage of Roe v. Wade and all of the babies, all the lives that have been lost, and all the mothers' lives that have been changed forever since 1973. Currently, Tennessee Right to Life is on Facebook and Twitter. Um, we use those platforms as a way to educate, to inform, and to call to action. I think that that is so fundamental and important 
to get the message from Nashville back home to all of our folks in the grassroots because they're the ones that make the difference. If today I posted something about abortion on Facebook, the left, the ones who would call themselves pro-choice, um, they will immediately attack. It's overwhelming and they will, they will consume the post. Where are the people who believe in the value of life? How come they don't engage? Why is it that I get 500 to one emails and phone calls and texts and Facebook messages and Twitter messages of people who are pro-choice over people who are pro-life? I think the truth is on our side. Science is on our side. God is on our side. And I believe that the generation coming up, I mean, this is kind of the, the civil rights issue of their day. And uh, we're seeing more and more young people become involved, be bold, and taking part of saving women and the unborn. I know the people who sent me here are pro-life because they elected me and I straight told you that I'm pro-life and I'm gonna go to Nashville and I'm gonna legislate a pro-life foundation. I just wanna encourage y'all, get on social media, get on your texts, get on your emails, contact those of us up here. And you know what else you can do? If those of that you are pro-life, what if you started contacting the ones that are pro-choice? Don't just contact and encourage us, me. Find the ones that you know who are fighting against pro-life policy and kindly, gently pressure them to say, hey, Tennessee is pro-life. Tennessee cares about the value of the unborn child. It's vitally important for this legislation and for my job for constituents to reach out to their legislators and make sure their legislators know when pro-life laws are being voted on. And also to make sure that you elect pro-life legislators from your districts and you do the research to make sure that this person is fundamentally pro-life and will vote that way when they get into office. The only way to make abortion unthinkable is to convince people that it is a life. You would never go to a playground and kill a two-year-old. That child has a personality and a life and it has people that love it. But a child in the womb has the same. We haven't met the child in the womb yet. Although through the great technology of 3D and 4D ultrasound, we really now can meet the child in the womb. But just because that child doesn't have a voice doesn't mean that that child doesn't have value. So that is going to be the key to making this issue abortion unthinkable is to convince people that that child has value. This is the National Memorial for the Unborn. It is on the site of the former abortion clinic here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. This site is here for honoring those who have been aborted and to help bring healing to those men and women who have experienced abortion. We need it because it's part of that healing process. We grieve the loss of our children. And this is an opportunity for us to acknowledge that they were indeed children and not just the blob of tissue in the womb. And to say to them that you are worthy of love, that you are worthy of having been given life, even though you weren't born into this world. We say that because their dignity was robbed from them when they were aborted. So this is a way to help restore that dignity and to memorialize them in a way so that we acknowledge they are members of our family. The plaques that are here on the wall are names of children. Some of them don't have names. It's a way for us to remember who they are. So what I would say to the World Health Organization is that these names represent a contradiction. They're not keeping track of all the things that happened to a woman after that abortion. To me, that says that they're not really in the business of aborting children for the care of that person or for their mental health or for their emotional health or for their physical health.
Part of what happens when people place these plates on the wall is a healing from that emotional and that mental trauma that they experienced from their abortion. I think about Adam every day because he's a part of me. He's a part of my family. He was placed in my womb and that I made a choice to remove him and to not give him life. I don't beat myself up anymore about it or I wouldn't be able to function. I just remember him and I'm looking forward to seeing him in heaven.